G'day, mate. Welcome along to episode 85 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. It's so good to have you here. Today, we have a special guest on the show, Katie Schofield, sports scientist, nutritionist, elite athlete. She does it all. I had Katie on the podcast way back in 2017 on episode number 18, when we talked all about her international track cycling career, her struggles with uh, relative energy deficiency in sport and where she's heading to uh, back then, which was towards a PhD. We got Katie back on the show today and we talk about her research from her PhD, the most recent research that is coming out around female specific training, uh, relative energy deficiency and low energy availability in athletes and how that affects athletes as well. So sit back, strap in, This was an awesome interview. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Answered lots of questions that we had sent in from our listeners. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Dr. Katie Schofield. Katie Schofield, so good to see you. Uh, Back for another chat. I was uh, looking back through the archives. We last sat down in episode 18 of the podcast. This is episode 85. Wow. Uh, and it was in July 2017, four years ago, almost to the day, I'd say. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy how that time's gone. Well yes. done, Maddie, on all your podcasts. Well, it doesn't say much that we're four years in and there's only 85 <laughs> podcasts, though, does it? <laughs> it probably is a uh, reflection of how little I've done in the podcasting world. but. <laughs> well, in my mind, a- 18 to 80-odd, you know, it's a big difference yeah yeah oh, for sure over four years for sure for sure yeah a for effort let's say exactly but <laughs> uh i uh, i had a re re re-listen of episode 18 uh the other day in preparation for this and mm-hmm. if if you haven't listened to it uh definitely get back and listen to it because it's an interesting chat we talk all about your cycling history and at the end for about the last 15 minutes we touch on uh, your experience with REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport, and then start talking about your future, which was going to be studying uh, and and working towards your PhD, which you were just in your first year of um, of being enrolled in, and so now we're at the complete opposite end of that, and you'll be pleased we're sitting here so that I stop hounding you uh, for an interview at some stage. I keep messaging Katie on, on Instagram whenever she puts out some fantastic stuff, saying, oh, we should really get together and chat. She's like, just give me some time. Just give me some time. <laughs> so now she's got some time, so we're here. So um, have, give us an update. Where are we at with uh, with your research and everything like that? Yeah, yeah, it's been a journey. Um, so what have been around... Yeah, just over a month ago that I defended my thesis and, yeah, was awarded my doctorate, which is pretty pretty exciting that it's come to a complete, oh, yeah, I guess the journey has ended on that front with my study. Yeah, that's fantastic. So Dr. Schofield is in the house. <laughs> yeah, I'm still not getting used to that, but yes, that that's correct. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so what, what did your research end up being about? Yeah, sure. So um, really what my research adds to the current body of literature is the way I've done my research. So my main thing going into the PhD was we know, well, at the time, we knew a lot about the physiological aspects of red ass um, and and what the impacts of not having enough fuel on board would do to like a physiological functioning, whether that's a suppression in um, reproductive hormones or if it's increasing injury, bone health, that type of thing. So So there was a lot of research coming out about the physiological implications of red ass And then, um, so that was kind of in the quantitative side of research. And Mm -hmm. then the more qualitative side 
of you know the the kind of um, thought processes or body perceptions that athletes or non-athletes might have that really came from the literature of eating disorders or disordered eating practices. But no one was really looking at the combination of, of both of those. So that's where my research was different. And I was really interested to know, okay, if we have a group of athletes, they may present symptoms of red ass, but what is actually happening around that individual in terms of the environment they're in, the culture that surrounds them, what are their perceived perceptions of nutrition or body image, and then does that have a driving force or does that mm. influence their nutritional practices or even training practices, which then exacerbate the red S syndrome? Yeah, fantastic. That sounds super interesting. I mean, it's the whole whole picture, isn't it? Which is, well, maybe not the whole picture, but a lot of the picture, and maybe a lot more than often. Um, you know, science often digs into. We sort of focus on such a small part, but this sort of seems that it's kind of connecting those two sides of of the equation, which is fantastic to hear. So, just just give everyone a little bit of a rundown on red S and. Mm. That'll probably lead into LEA as well, yes. I, I expect. Yeah, yeah. So what red S is, um, Maddie explained it before, relative energy deficiency in sport. It is a syndrome that impairs the functions of many body systems. So that's including cardiovascular, the gastrointestinal, um, reproductive function, endocrine um, body systems and those are just a few that have been researched um, and so if these body systems and the others are not functioning optimally then then this also has an impact on sport performance and this is where the red s model um, is really great because it it caters for sport performance impairment um, i i like view the red s model or syndrome is an umbrella term that really encapsulates the effects um, of a range of those those body systems. And really red S develops when there's not enough energy or dietary energy available for the body to perform all its functions. So this is where low energy availability comes in. And Low energy availability is when there's insufficient energy to support normal physiological function once um, the cost of energy ex is expended during exercise. So really, in, in other words, it's when the body does not have enough energy from the diet for individuals to exercise and have the energy to carry out basic body functions so i hope that that makes sense yeah so in a, in a nutshell we're, we're 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 eating all of our food uh and a certain amount of that goes to just maintaining a daily general function and health mm -hmm. and then obviously if we're doing exercise or training on top of that some of it goes to that and what you're saying is that in this uh, scenario there's a lot of exercise happening or pay potentially limited food going in to fuel the exercise and so the thing that suffers potentially is uh, all of that that health those health complications tend to to crop up because of that because there's not enough energy to support that is that kind of what you're saying yeah it, exactly and it can develop in a, a range of ways so someone might be intentionally reducing what what they're eating mm -hmm. whether um, that might be through an eating disorder or disordered eating but it also can be unintentional in that individuals, you know, they might have an upswing in their training volume or training intensity and they, they haven't increased their nutritional intake to, to accommodate that. So that's where someone can fall into having low energy availability just because they haven't accounted for the extra energy used in training. Um, yeah. Yep, fantastic. And what what's some of the the side effects to this? All the 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 negatives uh, that come out of this low energy availability. 
Yeah, um, it ranges for people. So you might not have all of the sy symptoms that I'll, I'll explain. Um, and what is great about this Reader syndrome is it includes men as well. So it's mm -hmm. not just a um, sex-specific condition. Um, so for females, you're looking at irregular or missed periods. Um, a common one, both male and female, is recurring injuries or illnesses. Uh, a lot of athletes may have more of um, like bronchitis type um, symptoms. There could be fluctuations in mood. So you might be happy one day, really depressed the next day, or you might just have a really low mood for a set mm -hmm. period of time. Fatigue's an issue. Um, gut, sorry, fatigue is a symptoms. There's gut issues. So you might be feeling bloating or have constipation or diarrhea, those types of things. Uh, for, for men, what one of the, I guess, I wouldn't say criteria, but um, a checklist, you could say, is morning erections, like how many of them are you having and is that normal um, or reduced, low mm -hmm. libido. But another one is like, are you adapting to your training? Like, how is your performance going? Yeah. Yeah, so if, if you're not getting enough energy and you're not even meeting those sort of natural uh, body rhythms almost, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sleep can be affected as well. should mention yep. that. And so a lot of your research, correct me if I'm wrong, focused on females. Is that is that right? Yeah, like um, I did study both men and women, but I guess um, – most of the, the findings that I've pulled out mm -hmm. are mainly female-based. Yeah. Excellent. And that's kind of what we wanted to focus this podcast around today is a lot around uh, those differences between males and females uh, in, in training and, and preparation and what we can potentially do to shape females' training a little better around mm. specific physiological needs. So what, just give us a bit of a background around some of the the, the differences between male or female and, and how those relate to sort of training, I guess, uh, on, on, a, on a broad spectrum, and then we'll dive into some of these questions that we've got from listeners around more specifics. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess why we don't know much about the female athlete is because there's not much research done on it, mm -hmm. right? Most of the research on exercise physiology or exercise nutrition um, is done on men and then that's extrapolated and generalised to women. Um, and it's really around this whole menstrual cycle that women have and it deemed, and I'm, I've got ear quotes, um, mm -hmm. problematic or difficult. Um, and, and I guess that's why we don't know, know a lot um, we are starting to know more as more research has been done, which is great. Um, but even then, within the research, if there's women involved, then they're typically studied when they're in the low hormone phase, so mm -hmm. in, uh, between day one and day seven or 14. Um, and so we still don't know enough because, you know, a typical menstrual cycle is 28 days give or take everyone's a little bit different so mm -hmm. i think um yeah there's still still a lot still a lot to know but in terms of um sorry were you gonna ask a question i was just a, gonna ask a question around uh most of that research being done done in that low hormone phase is that done in that low hormone phase because uh the females are most like men uh, ear quotes again during that low hormone phase or is it just done during that low hormone phase because there's less fluctuation or, or why is that yeah it's it's because one there's less fu fluctuation and you have a, um you're right the women are more like men i guess and it's it's easier in terms of we know that the the hormones during that phase are pretty stable 
And when we when we're saying more like men, it's because there's uh, less estrogen or progesterone in, in that in that phase. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We can run through. I can do a quick summary of hormones in, um, yeah, in the menstrual absolutely. cycle, That'd if you would like. Yeah. So, like, there's a typical, you know, textbook. They have 28 days for a menstrual cycle. But really, this can vary from individual to individual. So I will just say 28 days for simplicity. Um, And then we go into a follicular phase, which is uh, where we have low estrogen and low progesterone. And that's where day one is where we have our first day of bleeding um, for our period and the period again is individualized for each um, person but typically it is the first 14 days or um, that is the low hormone phase that leads into ovulation and ovulation typically occurs around day 14 if you're running a 28 day cycle. Um, Around ovulation you have an upswing um, or an elevation in estrogen and then after ovulation, that's where we get a little bit of um, a downward swing of estrogen and then we go where estrogen goes up again. And also you have progesterone that increases and that's in our high hormone phase and that's called the, the luteal phase. So that's a general overview of the menstrual cycle. Yeah, fantastic. So 28 days First half is what we're referring to as the low hormone phase. Second half, essentially, is what we're referring to as the high hormone phase, which we get that increase in estrogen. Uh, And we'll probably come back to that because that can affect performance a little bit around there. But there's plenty of things that we can do to sort of balance it out, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. And I guess, like, going back um, there, or we can discuss this, as well like different nutritional strategies based Mm. on those hormone fluctuations yeah awesome yeah i guess from a low energy availability standpoint where um, females and males differ is low energy availability can hit women more than men Mm. and that's all around this neuropeptide called kisspeptin um, so kisspeptin affects the neurons in the, hypothalamus, in the hypothalamus and so when energy intake is low that's when these neurons are down regulated and that can reduce endocrine function, it can reduce your luteinizing hormone pulses which we need to have a menstrual cycle. So it can reduce our estrogen, progesterone, and then that affects our thyroid function and so on. But in men, they're not as sensitive to the changes in low energy availability. So that's where they can probably sustain having less energy intake to a certain point um, compared to, to a female athlete. So that's probably like one main difference is our sensitivity mm-hmm. to kisspeptin which you know has all these other down regulated effects on yep. just normal physiological functioning yeah so i uh, just just this kind of leads nicely into um one of the questions here we got got from one of our listeners is that they're saying that they've read read a little bit about specific female training and the hormones and etc through uh, the book Raw, which is mm-hmm. a great resource from uh, Stacey Sims. Um, and if you haven't read that, definitely well worth checking out. Um, and, and, and and they say that obviously the science points to a difference, but in a practical sense, does it really matter uh, in terms of how we're, tr- we're structuring our training uh, around these differences between between males and females? I, my my short answer is is yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, in a practical sense, I I think it does. But I also want to highlight that you really have to know you. You really have to know your athlete, um, and that's where tracking is really vital. Mm-hmm. So if you 
are someone who has a regular or a, um, menstruating, uh, it's it's just another tool to add to your toolbox of mm. understanding how you feel and how you perform throughout your cycle. Um, and there's some apps out there that you can use like wild.ai um, or just paper tracking um, how you're feeling with certain sessions because everyone has different experiences and being able to tailor your training based on how you feel given where you are in the menstrual cycle can then like help um, improve adaptation or improve recovery, if this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really just having that objective data to then look back on, okay, every time this month I feel, I feel average. Okay, so if that is a common occurrence, then maybe that day we just reduce the training load a little bit. So that you can recover more. I mean, it all depends on where you are in the cycle. Yeah. Yeah. So just and, and I completely understanding that everyone uh, will be different, but uh, as a general rule of thumb, where would uh, typical blocks or typical uh, phases of training land in the cycle for optimal results? So where would we kind of load load somebody up right. with higher intensity or more volume, or where would you uh, focus your recovery on in, in general? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so if we are talking about someone who's got um, a re regular cycle, so we typically can break it into uh, sections. So during your your the the low hormone phase, so we're talking day one to day fourteen. This is probably where you can hit more of the high intensity sessions, your strength sessions. Um, you can near the end of um, that cycle where you're hitting into ovulation, you get a big increase in estrogen and that allows you, you know, to push more. Your body is more um, able to handle training demands, um, might not feel as fatigued. You won't experience as much pain, so you should be able to push your body more. Um, and so you just basically have a, a greater tolerance. So that's probably in that phase where you can really start to, to push the body. And given in that phase, your body's going to be able to recover better. So that's, that's probably where I would emphasize more high-intensity training um, and more strength power. Whereas in the high hormone phase, uh, this is probably where you could do more of your endurance adaptations. Um, so that's where you'd have more of the volume over the intensity. Um, and then kind of tapering off near the end of uh, the high hormone phase, some individuals might not feel that great leading into having their period. So this is probably where you could focus on more technique. Um, it could be like a mix of low intensity, moving the body, but it's probably more of a recovery week type thing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that kind of leads nicely to the, to the sort of next uh, question around um, athletes becoming fixated on, on the tracking of their menstrual cycle and performing or feeling that they can only perform at certain times. Mm. And this is a message that I've heard a number of times from um, kind of high-level coaches, both male and female, and just around them not wanting to let athletes uh, get too reliant on it. So they almost, as long as they're having uh, a regular menstrual cycle and having regular periods so that they're, they're healthy, then what... Uh, how does that lead into that? Because if we've got athletes that think they can only perform during a certain phase of their cycle, and then all of a sudden their big competition lands on one of those days that are in their 
uh, high hormone phase and they know now that they can't perform very well and they always take their recovery during that high hormone phase, mm-hmm. um, how, how do we work through that sort of minefield, I guess, of the science shows this, we sh- you know, it's, it's logical that we should be training this way, but however, in the real world, this is the other side of the equation, where do those two meet in your eyes and, and how can we get the most out of that? Yeah, I fully understand the the coach's concerns and even some of the athletes' concerns when they feel average and they know they're going to compete when they're feeling average and it's a big psych element to it. Where I come from it is we're using the cycle for adaptation. We're using the cycle with our training to get adaptation. So... Um, it it doesn't mean that you can't compete well in any given stage of your cycle. It's about management and it's about mm-hmm. understanding how you feel might not relate to how you perform. And I also want to challenge coaches and challenge probably more the athletes is there's going to be times where maybe you shouldn't have a deload week when you're feeling average because you need to experience what it's like if you're going to be racing in that phase of your cycle because mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to change the the day of your competition, you know. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's more if you know this is where tracking is really great, if you know and understand how you feel, how the body is during that particular phase, that's where you can get some extra advice on how to mitigate those mm. feelings. Um, and, and it's also understanding the changes that happen during the cycle. Um, so, for example, in the high hormone phase, we're probably not going to be able to utilize carbohydrate that well. So we need to make sure we've got nutritional strategies where we're actually fueling with more carbohydrate to mitigate that difference. Does that make sense? Yeah, so when you say uh, not able to utilize carbohydrate uh, as efficiently, is that in respect to like accessing a muscle glycogen or breaking down muscle glycogen to use it? So if you can't do that as well, you've got to be putting more in your mouth so that it's a readily available in the bloodstream. Is that sort of how that works? Or Yeah, yeah. So in the high hormone phase, estrogen spares glycogen to utilize more fat, uh, free fatty acids. Mm-hmm. But if you're, in an, uh, um, if you're doing a high intensity session or you've got a race that's got some um, high speeds elements or, you know, you're on the threshold and you'll be using your glycogen stores, that's where you need to make sure you're having more carbohydrate nutritionally to mm-hmm. make sure that your body can utilize the carbohydrate because yeah. it's easier yeah, so to that, use carbohydrate than fat, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you're not having to go into the muscle and break it down and, and, and bring it out because your body's not letting you do that uh, just because of your hormone levels. So just mm-hmm. by chucking more in your mouth, it's in your bloodstream and your body can still use it even though... Um, it's not letting it come out of the muscle. Yeah. That's um that's awesome. And um it's 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 always been a bit of a an interesting one for me because obviously when when the book Raw came out, I sat down and read it. I was like, This is fantastic. Started thinking around changing training of all the female athletes that I work with and then having other conversations with uh other other coaches, scientists that I fully respect. It, it, that that whole topic came up. We don't want people to become fixated on it, uh, and you can't control when races are. We should make sure that our uh, athletes are healthy. However, we don't want to become too reliant on it. So then I swung my thinking back mm-hmm. the other way, uh, and and now um, for me, this is going to be uh, something that I really want to put into action with the athletes that I work with. Uh, around um, around structuring a little bit more specifically. So the next question is completely off the the, the, the sheet that we've got in front of us, uh, Katie, and it's a, a purely selfish question for my learning. Mm-hmm. But if 
if you had a race coming up and you knew that it was going to be in your high hormone phase, so not in an ideal time for you to be competing. Depends on the race, so Maddie. Depending on the race. <laughs> so if we're if we're yeah. thinking uh, endurance an endurance event, yeah, uh, which will be most of um, our our listeners. So a long uh, endurance event, multi sport mm-hmm. or triathlon. Sure. So with with that in mind, potentially let's say most of those happen in summer so it's not going to be super hot conditions but mild new zealand summer conditions so with that in mind what would you do training wise leading into the event uh in the sort of the six weeks out where your training is becoming more specific to the event itself in terms of terrain and your trial and race nutrition and and that sort of jazz uh, and we're not necessarily just looking for adaptation now uh, that let's say we structured all of our training around our menstrual cycle uh, further out to get the adaptations we were after mm-hmm. in that in that phase closer to the race would you specifically train harder in the high hormone phase potentially it's not as good for getting that adaptation but it teaches you or you get familiar with uh, pushing hard in that in that time when you're going to have to do it in the race. Is, is that a logical thing to do or would you always chase the adaptation channel in the in the low hormone phase? Yeah, it's such a good question, Maddie. Um, I guess it really comes down to what the athlete is comfortable doing. Um, and I think you're, you will still get adaptation in that mm. high hormone phase if you're doing high intensity I think it would be good in terms of a psychological element for the athlete if that's something that they they want to use. Um, In terms of the adaptation, you'll get slightly different adaptations to then what you would get in the low hormone phase. Um, I guess it it comes down to race preparation. What is the, the big blocks that that athlete needs to make sure they have dialed? And... Um, yeah, I guess if you have got the adaptations that you were looking for six weeks out, then that's fantastic. What are the fine-tuning things that you need to work on leading, you know, six weeks out? Because I assume there would be a taper phase before yeah, absolutely. that session. So you might be looking at a five- to four-week final training block and, it might be more of um, back-to-back trainings or longer trainings. I'm not not sure how you'll program, but um, mm. it, what I say in a nutshell depends on what the athlete really is is wanting to experience, I guess. Yeah, for and, sure. But... Sorry. I was just saying, absolutely. Uh, but you do you think there would be value in training in those those, that high hormone phase deliberately often uh, where you would normally program a recovery phase as long as that recovery happened elsewhere just to, so that an athlete can mentally tick those boxes of oh I, I'm okay to uh, you know perform if they were having uh, issues around getting their head around this is my high hormone phase I don't usually perform well here I've had recovery phases this whole time you know throughout my training and I have to race in a high hormone phase um, do you think it would be worthwhile in, in, in doing that, I guess, is my question? Oh, I think it's definitely worthwhile because then you mm. can start putting in nutrition, hydration strategies yep. to, to mitigate potential um, feelings. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Back to the uh, programmed questions. Sorry <laughs> for going off. <laughs> Sorry for no, going it's a good question. And, and I guess uh, uh, while we're talking around this is, uh, around elite athletes and then mid-packers uh, in terms of is it worth mid-packers or age groupers that are just focusing on completing an event, uh, is it worth them uh, following this type of training where we're planning around our menstrual cycle? Is it worth it them doing it or is it just really a thing for elite athletes? Oh, I think if you can use your body to its advantage at any stage. So I see it value no matter where where you're at in terms of, of level. Um, if you want to get the most out of 
your body, then yeah, you can definitely train train to your cycle. If that's what you want to call it. Yeah, and there and there's benefits in doing it for for athletes of all ability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where are we up to? Practical strategies to minimise the impact of your training. Uh, performance or competition during that high hormone phase? Practical strategies. So one of the things in the high hormone phase, we touched on it before, is where you have high estrogen and that's where you can spare glycogen. Um, So that's where you probably want to be increasing your carbohydrate intake. So that, that's one. Um, progesterone being high is a catabolic hormone. So basically it can break down um, body tissues, being muscle. So that's where you want to really focus on having protein um, mm. before and after training to, to negate that, the, the loss and breakdown. Um, in terms of hydration, this is, is quite key, particularly if you're in a hot environment. So with hydration, um, when you have the hormones that are high in that, that uh, luteal phase, um, that's where your plasma volume drops. Um, so, so meaning that there's less fluid available for blood circulation and for sweating. So in the high hormone phase, females particularly have higher um, body temperatures. Um, So really we want to negate one increase in body temperature. So you might need to um, have some extra cooling strategies, um, whether it's pre-cooling during during the event, some, some cooling strategies. Um, but then you also have to be mindful of uh, increasing your hydration. Um, so, because we really want to um, improve the the plasma volume mm-hmm. um, during that high hormone phase. Yeah, so hydration is really important during the luteal phase. Yeah. So pretty much more of everything, more carbohydrate, more protein, more more fluids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that probably makes it in the high hormone phase. In the high hormone phase, yep. Yeah. Um, and then then you could look at also sleep might be affected um, mm. because of the higher body temp that women experience in the high hormone phase. Risk sleep, uh, sorry, restorative sleep does require a drop in core body temperature. mm so if you're running hot, going to bed, you are probably not going to have as good a sleep as we were in the low hormone phase. So ways to mitigate that is having a brief cold shower before you go to bed drops your body temperature. So then when you go to sleep, you have a more restorative sleep. Yep. Um, oh, we'll, we'll tackle the one around. Is there a clear way to work out if you're lacking something uh, and you're in need of a supplement. Yeah, uh, interesting question. Um, for me, how I would tackle that is really what are, are you doing the, the basics right? Look at the foundation pillars, like I call it. Is the training going well? How is your recovery? Are you mm-hmm. sleeping well? Um, what's the stress like? Um, yep. is, is that full gas? So... And then, and then it's the other layer of nutrition. Are you eating appropriately? You know, yeah. so I think if those things are all you believe down pat, um, I believe that a lot of people underestimate recovery and stress. Absolutely. So if those things are all, all top notch and you're still feeling like something's not right, then... Yeah, I guess that's probably where you need to go to a GP and say, hey, maybe we need to get some blood screens done um, just just to see, especially if you're susceptible to maybe having low iron or something like that. But, yeah, 
the biggest thing is, okay, let's look at the big foundation pillars first. Are, are there areas that we can improve there first? Yeah, cool. And, and so rather than just jumping for the supplement or the thing off the shelf, think about tackling that foundation first, making sure all of the, the basics are done right, and then uh, then go from there. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting because the second part of that question is, uh, is there a way to work out if you need something extra, such as supplements, or are you just tired from juggling too much work, family, mm. kids, training, etc.? cetera? Or, uh, so the, the whole juggling of work, family, kids, and training is such a big stress load, isn't it? Huge, huge stress load. And I guess particularly for females having high stress raises cortisol that has a massive effect on hormones and for females with high stress that's it's just um an added layer (laughs) to to deal with in terms of how our bodies process and how we can adapt to training yep and i and i think if you're if you're juggling work family and kids and training my gut feeling would be that you that you aren't doing the basics right because Possibly. the basics are one of the first things to sort of slide away from experience um, when when kids come into the mix, especially because one of the first things that's just, uh, affected is your sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, just because you're not in control of that anymore of how long you're going to sleep for um, or the potential quality of that sleep. It's really hard to get a, a good night's sleep when you're sleeping in a single bed <laughs> with a with a squiggly five year old or a four year old or whatever it might be, um, and so just yeah, nailing down on those basics will probably be um, yeah really beneficial um, off off the bat. I would say if if that is your situation, and if you go through and you tick all those boxes and you're doing everything mm. all those basics right, then yes, maybe we do need to look at something else. Mm. Yep. Fantastic. Um, we've got a question around eating after having a baby while still breastfeeding. Is that a, a question that you're comfortable to jump into and talk around, or it's not really your area? Or uh, it's, it's not really my expertise, but basically, yep. um, in a nutshell, you need to be eating a lot more than probably pre-baby. Um, just because you are breastfeeding, uh, there is an en- energy cost to pro- producing breast milk. Um, so, yeah, and that would just be increased calories, probably having more dairy just because when you're breastfeeding, you can have, um, you can draw more calcium from your bones. So, yeah, it's just making sure the dietary aspects of that is probably... Is, is a lot more than, than just your general population. Yep. So you mentioned um, having GI issues or s- issues with your stomach mm-hmm. uh, when it's uh, in relation to low energy availability before. Yes. And so can you just talk a little bit more around the link between those GI issues and low energy availability and some of the signs and symptoms and, and how you can go about managing those as, a, as an athlete? Yeah, yeah. So it's not well researched actually, but um, something I'm really keen to get into just because I'm I'm fascinated it, fascinated by it, and from my own personal experiences. But it, it's essentially um, your gut is not able to repair itself um, or maintain its ability to. Uh, repair itself after you know hard intense exercise and and having that low energy availability increases the the lack of repair mm. so then then what happens in the, in the gut is the gut becomes more permeable um, things can pass through it more easily you're not able to digest your the food um, to digest and to absorb the nutrients as much and it just pretty much goes straight through you. So that's where you um, really need to focus on your gut microbiome, and that's probably one of the one things that disappears. Um, And 
So this is where the gut health is really important, not only for general health, but gut microbiome is really important for uh, hormones. Um, it's important for cognitive function. It's important for mood, like depression or anxiety. Um, it's it's needed for bone health. So having a good gut is going to make you a healthier person. So how do we get a better gut? Um, if you have suffered from low energy availability, one way to improve your gut health and your gut microbiome is to have like prebiotic and probiotic foods. Um, and you don't necessarily have to go down the supplement road. So like a prebiotic is in your fibrous fruit and vegetables. So that's like your avocados, uh, kiwi fruit, passion fruit, apples, pears, beetroots, you know, like green leafy vegetables, root vegetables, those types of things. So just having a good array of that in your diet is really helpful for your gut. Um, also things like uh, oats and rice and stuff like that that are high fiber. But then you can have the probiotic. So those foods are like kefir, the kimchi. These are the fermented foods. Um, kombucha, sauerkraut, I think, and there's another one, like tempeh. So those are the mm -hmm. fermented foods. So they're really good for your gut bacteria to just restore itself, have a good, healthy bacteria. And then that's going to help you to absorb the nutrients that you do eat so you can get the most bang out of your buck of your food that you do eat. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and obviously, we're talking a lot about food, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but you are, uh, what do you call it, a nutritionist? Yes. Is that the correct terminology? Yeah, I'm, I'm a registered nutritionist. So A registered nutritionist. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, Katie's got great insights on uh, on how to tackle these things. So if you're wondering, well, why is this PhD person giving out all this nutrition <laughs> advice when she studied uh, something different? She is a registered nutritionist as well. So we've got that. We're lucky enough to have the combos here today of uh, all the knowledge. So I'll, I think a lot of the time uh, low energy availability readiness come about because athletes are trying to drive down their weight uh, to get light, increase their power to weight ratio. Um, how do you go about losing weight in a healthy manner, uh, or what? Is, what's your thoughts are around that for athletes who who potentially need to, or who potentially want to uh, change their body composition? Mm. Yeah, um, I come from it from two angles, and it's it's one. I like to look at the well being of the athlete. Like, what is the is there a legitimate reason why they want to lose the weight? Um, like a lot of athletes come to me and say, I want to lose weight because I'm going to get faster or I'm going to go better. But really they want to lose weight because they want to look good, you know. So I think it's coming they wanna, down. They want to look different. Yeah, they want to look different. Yes. <laughs> not necessarily, they don't necessarily not look good the way they are, Katie. Right. Okay. <laughs> Yes, good point, good point. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think if it's a legitimate, yeah, pr improved performance, and um, that that's fine. It's just making sure you are working with someone to help you do that and you're not doing it on your own because it can get um, to a stage where you're in this low energy availability and then it becomes chronic and then you have red S and it's really hard to bounce back from. So uh, you really need to be working with someone if, if that is the case, so a nutritionist or a dietitian to lose the weight in a healthy way. There are ways around that. Um, from, I guess, my experience and background working with athletes to really mitigate the risk of low energy availability, I really focus on nutrition around the training. So making sure that before, during and after the training, the nutrition is really dialed in and we're covering what's being used. 
um, in training as well as making sure that the athletes are having enough nutrition on board just to sustain that general day-to-day living. And then it's manipulating foods outside of the training where we could potentially um, maybe have a lower calorie intake near the end of the day, maybe where they're not training. Um, but really it's, it's about tweaking where you put the nutrition intake and it has to be around the training. Yeah, so don't don't let don't compromise your nutrition around your training if you're going to look at uh, uh, adjusting what you're eating. Do that outside of that time period. Yes, absolutely. And there's this big fad about faster training um, and a lot of athletes, female athletes in particular, come to me and say, okay, I want to try faster training or um, especially early morning training. Mm-hmm. And they've tried it and they're like, I can't shift the body fat percent. Like, I can't shift it. And it's it's because your body is already in a stress state when it's hungry. Mm. And then you train and you stress it even more. And then the body's going, well, I'm not going to... I'm not going to get rid of this fat because I need it. My body's in a high yeah. stress state. So I think that's where when we have, um, you know, popular media, media coming in saying faster training is the best, we, we lose weight. But for female athletes, it goes the other way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, if you're using faster training to, to lose weight uh, as such, it's not, not a great, it's been kind of shown that it's not a great, uh, mechanism for that is it and I, I use faster training a, uh, a bit as a as a training tool mm-hmm. to improve endurance uh, mm-hmm. you know improve that metabolism of metabolizing more fat not necessarily losing fat mass from your body but getting your better body better at uh, doing endurance uh, but what that allows you to do is being faster it allows you to not go out and train for as long. So it's a little bit of a shortcut if you don't have the time to go mm-hmm. out and do long sessions where you can get the same adaptations but with less. But, yeah, it turns from a training tool for some people to then this is how I'm going to train every single session yep. for the rest of my life. And that's where it becomes a bit of a problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, sure. And as long as you're fueling uh, around it after it and then using it in that manner for sure. Um Interesting, interesting. So what what would be your general approach for nutrition for mm-hmm. endurance athletes? Mm. Sort of day-to-day training nutrition. Yeah, it's, um, it's very much keep it simple. Mm-hmm. So um, make sure that before a training session you have a decent meal beforehand depending on the type of training um, will determine exactly what that looks like and when your last meal was and when your last training session was um, but but general it is simple it's colorful fruit and vegetables it's a good source of carbohydrate it's lean protein um, and if if there are any vegan or vegetarian athletes who are listening to this, um, your protein then has to be a high quality protein from a supplement form just to make sure that you are covering those protein protein needs. Um, yeah, whole grains and just really looking after that gut. You know, the gut mm. health is, is really kind of those things. Um, Around training, so yeah, before, during, and and after. So before carbohydrate, maybe protein carbohydrate mix. During, depending on the session, there would be carbohydrates in that, particularly from food. I like to do food in the pocket, hydration in the bottle, so keeping mm-hmm. them separate. Um, and then after is really focusing on carbohydrate and protein intake. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and I think we just sort of skipped over that little hydration thing because that's a great little saying there, uh, hydration in the bottle, food in the pocket. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Because 
there's so many sports drink out there that uh, that crossover becomes all all in the bottle. So I just want to talk a little bit more about that because I know uh, for me that's a, a, a key message as well. Mm, yeah, so where this whole hydration, carbohydrate stuff came in was through marketing and um, saying well, you can get all your hydration and carbohydrate needs in one system, which in a race situation possibly is beneficial for like Ironman events and stuff like that where it can be quite challenging to eat solid foods, even for like, I guess, coast to coast and stuff like that, right? Um, mm. So they, they mix a high carbohydrate um, solution that might be dextrose, um, glucose type mix to get the carbohydrate intake as well as having electrolytes in there for the hydration. So you have a one-stop shop, basically, as a sports drink with carbohydrate. Um, that That is okay, but there gets to a point where it can get quite sickly. And the longer you exercise, I'm not sure if your listeners experience this, but the longer you exercise, your palate changes. And it, it becomes from not wanting sweet food to more wanting savoury food. So then that, that sports drink might not really be beneficial. Um, but that's where I like having the carbohydrates in the solid form. One, yeah. because it's probably more, you can pick foods that are slower releasing carbohydrate compared to your higher carbohydrate foods like you might have gels or something or bananas, but you could take in your pocket if you're going for a long ride, something like a, I don't know, like baked potatoes or something, cold baked potatoes are really good um, during long sh- sessions or making a cake that's quite energy dense. Um, so that's kind of where I like to get athletes to get used to eating proper food on on training sessions and then having your hydration which just has an electrolyte mix in it so it's no carbohydrate it just has a you know a range of um like your your salt salt mix in it yeah does that answer your question or help you yeah but i just wanted you to uh, to elaborate on on that on that concept of uh not necessarily yeah, drinking everything out of the bottle that gets your carbohydrate and your sodium and your fluid all in one because when you mix it up like that, it's not overly good uh, at either of them, is it, in terms of if you put carbohydrate in the drink, it compromises the hydration aspect of it. Yeah. If you want to maximise hydration, you put more salt, more fluid in it, water the carbohydrate down, and then it's not as good for fueling. So keeping those two separate can be uh, a lot lot more effective and if you're training day to day as well uh your teeth and your dentist well your Mm -hmm. dentist won't thank you for it um the the dentist (laughs) will thank you if you just keep sipping away on the carbohydrate drink but your wallet will thank you because you don't have uh bad teeth either so keep it uh food in your pocket fuel in your pocket hydration in your bottle great tip yep and also we'll save you coin too because sports drinks and sport foods are quite expensive when you think about it and you can get all your needs from just normal food absolutely it's quite good for training the gut as well eh? in terms absolutely. of getting some volume in there as well getting used to having uh you know solids in your stomach because when you do race long you, you there is a time where solids are going to play into the equation at some stage yeah i was just about to say training the gut um just like a training program your body can adapt and your gut can adapt Mm. to digesting absorbing foods it does take time um but definitely definitely something to work towards katie we're coming to the end of our uh, list of questions here um do you just want to leave us with some final thoughts kind of to summarize if you were to have one minute with someone and you wanted to get them the key messages that are going to uh, help them the most uh, from your perspective, what would they be in terms of, we've kind of outlined them all now, but if you were to summarise them. 
Yeah, I think um, for me is knowing your body. So this is where tracking comes in, just having an understanding and an awareness um, of how you're feeling and how you respond to particular training sessions. I, 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 I'm going to kind of like play devil's advocate because we are, I believe, growing to be this population that rely on gadgets and rely on everything to give us our stats. Mm. And that's great. But I also don't know how many athletes really hone in without looking at the data. How does that, how do I actually feel in that session? You know, um, was I feeling strong? Was I feeling powerful without knowing if the power's correlated with that on the bike yep. or, you know, your splits on a run or whatever. So I think it's really important to have an, an awareness of, of how you're feeling in sessions. Um, and then I go back to, but, but then um, tracking where you are in your cycle, I think is still really important. One, mm. because um, if you don't track it and you don't know how often you have your cycle, then how do you know if you're feeling appropriately? Because one of my things is if you have a normal cycle, and this is, I should probably, I should have said this earlier, that if you're on an oral contraceptive pill, you don't have regular cycles. Like Mm -hmm. that is the pill that creates your menstrual period. And I've got an air quotes period because it's not, Mm -hmm. it's a pill bleed. It's not your actual menstrual period so maybe that's a talk for another day but um yeah if you're not on any hormone contraception i feel like if you have it month to month then you know you're fueling appropriately and you're recovering well so that's where it's just important to keep tracking okay i've Mm -hmm. got this month i've got this month great 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 okay so that was one knowing knowing how you feel in training and your awareness around your training tracking menstrual cycles the other one is feeling appropriately around your training so it's before during and after and when i say feeling that also is food and fluid um so so making sure that and uh another one which we didn't really talk about but we kind of did was recovery and managing stress around training yep those would be my top three Fantastic. And you have blessed the world with your uh, latest uh, setting yourself up as a consultant, uh, coach. Um, How can people find out and work with you one-on-one if they want to really uh, get the knowledge from you? Where can they go? Yeah, thanks, Maddie. Um, This is an exciting venture that I've started to put together. Um, So they can, I've got a website, www.kt, that's with an I-E, dash Schofield.com. I have an Instagram account. If people are into Instagram, it's at underscore Katie underscore Schofield. Uh, Or they can email me, Mm katie.schofield.consulting at gmail.com. Um, yeah, just reach out. I am happy to to have a chat, see where I can maybe help help um, them either with nu- nutrition. Most of the clients I see are around nutrition, which is fantastic, mm. and I absolutely love it. Um, yeah, well, they can send me a message on Instagram or whatever. So it's fantastic, and I'll. I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash 85 for episode 85, and um, that'll all be there. So, Katie, uh, you can get in touch with Katie whenever you need to, and you can be in the know with SCO. <laughs> How's that Love the tagline? Tag. <laughs> Love the tagline on the website. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for your time today, Katie. Pleasure as always. And I think you're the first return guest. So Ooh, special. 
that is fantastic so it's great to catch up with you and all of your latest thanks so much maddie it's been great uh,